Hello, everyone. I'm Will, one of the pastors here at New Life Press. It's good to see you all uh, as we worship together. Uh, we are beginning a, a new but short series in the prophet Joel. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because our spiritual focus for the year is about restoration and finding healing and wholeness in Christ. And one of the ways that we could bring that theme out is by looking at an Old Testament prophet, and in our case, we're going to look at Joel, of how he calls people to find restoration back in God himself and not in the things of the world. And so if you're able, I want to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to read for our scripture passage today the entire chapter one of the book of Joel, Joel chapter one. So let me read that for us, and I pray that we'd have open hearts and minds here this morning. Joel chapter one. Verses 1 to 20. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children to another generation. What the cunning locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed, the grounds mourn because the grain is destroyed, the wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, whale or vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because of the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Put on slack cloth and lament, O priest, well, O ministers of the altar, go in past the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your Lord, of, our, of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land, to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty comes, is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed shrivels under the clods, and the storehouses are desolate. The granaries are torn down because the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed, because there is no pasture for them, even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call, for the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness." And this is God's word. Please take your seats at this time. Well, even when you read the entire chapter one of the book of Joel, you get a sense of desperation and devastation. There's a sense in which it seems very dark and gloomy in terms of what the prophet Joel is trying to convey. One of the ways you can understand what Joel is trying to get at is to be able to understand it from maybe a contemporary perspective. And you can imagine for yourself that the stock market crashes, you lose all your investments, the crypto market crashes, you lose all your Bitcoin and altcoins, you lost your job, perhaps you couldn't pay your mortgage and therefore you lose your real estate, you lose all your investments and everything that gives life and allows you to take care of yourself and your family. And the question then is at that point, because it has happened to many people in this country, what would you do? Where would you turn to? And Joel wants to speak into this because that's basically what happened to the people of Judah who Joel is talking about. But it's not going to be about investments or their houses per se, or it's going to be about crypto. But it's the same reality for them. They lost all their sustenance, all their wealth, but it comes to them in the form of agriculture. It's their fields. It's their vegetation. It was their wine. It was their ability to produce livelihood through their agricultural investments. They lost everything, and they're about to lose even more. And Joel is saying, where are you going to turn right now? 
in the most dire circumstances. And for Joel, this was a judgment on the people of God. The reason they lost everything was because Joel is giving them a warning that in the middle of the fruitfulness and success of life, you're neglecting and forgetting God for you. And because you're rejecting him and neglecting him and forgetting him, Joel brings this warning about a really deep devastation and judgment because God is holy and he's righteous, and he's giving them a judgment because he's saying to the people of Judah, you're trusting in other things besides God. And that's why he gives his judgment. And this judgment also relates to us today. And as you read chapter 1, you're thinking this seems like a farming culture. They're talking about locusts. They're talking about an invading army. But there is deep connection and correlation to our contemporary lives here today. And I want to just discuss with you a little bit about this very deep and dark and harsh warning and what that may mean for modern day people like you and me. But let's take a look at this, this sort of chapter one about the judgment of God. And there are three things that we'll consider that's very relevant. One, Joel describes the judgment. He's saying this is what judgment is going to look like, especially for those of us who neglect who God is. And then secondly, he's going to give very specific commands to three different types of people, three specific commands to three different types of people to encourage you to turn back to the Lord, which brings us to our third point. He says, there is going to be an out. I'm going to give you a way out of this, and that's going to be by turning to the Lord in repentance. So we'll look at first a judgment of God, secondly, the commandment of God, and then thirdly, we'll look at a turning to God a repentance towards God. So let's look at this, even though it seems so far and distant from us, let's look at God's judgment. The one thing that Joel starts off in the beginning of this book is to say that something huge and really big is about to happen. Joel is telling everyone, this is going to be once in a lifetime, and it's not going to be good. Read with me verse 2. Joel says, Hear this, you elders. Elders represent the leadership, those in power, the upper echelons of society. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Everyone listen up. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? It's rhetorical. What's about to happen? Has anything happened from what you can remember? It is so big that he's telling the people, it's going to last through generations, and you better tell your children, your grandchildren, and your grandchildren's children about what's about to happen. That's what he says in verse 3. Tell your children of it, and let your children, children tell their children, and their children to another generation. In other words, it's going to stand the test of time. It's really big. Nothing ever has happened like this. And so what is Joel talking about, this once-in-a-lifetime reality that's about to happen, that never happened in their lives? This is what he's saying. Locusts locusts. He's saying, this is the devastation and the judgment of God that's about to come to you. That's what he says in verse 4. Very poetically, he writes, what the cutting, cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. And in verse 4, that's basically the description of judgment. That's equivalent of saying the stock market is about to crash and the whole financial system is about to crumble. The mortgage market and the housing market is going to implode. You're going to lose everything. Supply chain is going to be devastated. Maybe it sounds a little bit familiar to the circumstances we find ourselves in. But they're talking about locusts. And the reason is because locusts, they kill and devastate everything in a farming culture. They kill everything that relates to the sustenance of an ancient Near Eastern culture that relies on farming and vegetation and land. You can't grow anything. Your livestock and your animals can't eat anything. You can't even worship because you can't grow the right fruits for your offering, and you can't raise the right animals to sacrifice. You can't do anything in life if the locusts hit your land. Now, one interesting thing to consider is that in verse 4, there are four different words for locusts, and scientists and zoologists, they all try to figure out, is there a logic to the four locusts and the four words there? And in fact, if you didn't realize this, the Bible has nine words for locusts. So four different words in verse 4, nine words for locusts in the entire Bible. They say that Eskimos have more than 40 different words for snow. 
And sociologists notice that when a culture has many different words for the same reality, it probably means that that concept and reality is really important to that particular people and culture. So when you have nine words and four words for locusts in one verse, it probably says to the Israelites, it's a very important reality. Now, some insect specialists try to make sense of the words and say these are the different types of locusts that come, or it's a development or an evolution of the different stages of a locust's life. But Joel, he's not a zoologist, he's not a scientist, he's not an entomologist, that's an insect specialist, he's a prophet. And I think the point of verse 4 is to say, it's not the stages of development of a locust, it's to say that this judgment, this warning, is going to be complete. It's going to be thorough. It's saying whatever the cutting locust left, the second wave is going to eat. Whenever the second wave of locusts comes and leaves, the third wave of locusts is going to devastate. There's going to be nothing left because of the righteous judgment of God for the people's neglect and amnesia of their relationship with their Heavenly Father. The judgment is going to be complete. That's how powerful and how righteous and how holy God is. Locusts consume entire fields of vegetation. They come in swarms in the Bible that essentially blacken out the sky. In fact, you see locusts throughout the Bible, and one of the reasons is because for some reason, in an agrarian culture, locusts have been equated with and became a major symbol of God's judgment towards his people. Let me try to give you a quick Bible survey of the nature of locusts as it relates to the judgment of God. So the first time we see about locusts as a judgment comes to us in this famous story in Exodus chapter 10. It's a covenant curse of God to Pharaoh of Egypt to let his people go. And this is what Moses says to Pharaoh in Exodus 10 verses 4 to 5. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. That's a lot of locusts. They come in swarms. They shall eat what is left to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. So here you see a devastation of the people, and the curse of God to rebellious non-Christians like Pharaoh and the Egyptians comes to them in the form of of a locust. That's the eighth plague, if you know the story of Exodus. Locusts come up again as a judgment, as a reminder in Deuteronomy 28. Locusts show again in the end times in Revelation 9, saying that the final judgment of the righteousness of Jesus as our king, the final judgment also comes in what form? Locusts. And in Revelation 9, it's a very valiant and actually scary picture because locusts look like an army. Their heads look like lions. They have an army for, or a shield and a, a helmet for a head. So it's a very harsh and picturesque picture of the judgment of God. It's everywhere in the Bible. But do you know where one place in the Bible that talks about locusts that show us really the purpose of judgment of God in the locusts that sort of gets glossed over but it's really important than the point that I'm trying to make in this sort of biblical survey? Well, in Mark chapter 1, verse 6, you have this guy. His name is John the Baptist. And when the authors introduce John the Baptist, he's sort of this eccentric Gen X type of person. He's a little bit strange, a little bit weird, but in both Matthew and Mark, they describe John in his dietary habits. And do you know what John the Baptist eats? Locusts and honey. The reason that's so important is this, and this is the point. Locusts always reflect the judgment of God is dark and is harsh. But when John the Baptist is introduced and he's eating locusts, I think God is telling us, you and me, that John the Baptist, who is basically Jesus' hype man, he's a forerunner. John the Baptist, his ministry is to roll out the red carpet for Jesus to come in. He's saying, I'm just giving you an introduction, an appetizer of what Jesus is going to do. And what Jesus is going to do is that he's going to reverse and absorb all the judgment and all the devastation and all the restrictions and all the hurt and the pain and the loss that we've seen for thousands of years that locusts brought as God's judgment, and Jesus is going to take that locust judgment upon himself. He'll take your devastation, your hurt, your rebellion, and your pain. The devourer, which are the locusts, is now going to be devoured 
in the grace and love of Jesus Christ. That's why John the Baptist, who Jesus is hype man, is introduced, and for the first time, man is eating locusts. And he's saying, this is just a picture of what Jesus is going to do universally on the cross of Jesus Christ for you and me. All the pain that we have, all the hurt, all the, all the locust curse that we deserve because of our sin and rebellion, Jesus is going to come and he's going to eat that up for us because that's the love and that's the grace of Jesus Christ. Locusts are a sign of the coming judgment of God. And for the book of Joel, locusts was just an illustration of an invading army of Babylon coming into Judah because of their neglect, kicking them out, devastating them, and that's a picture of God's righteous judgment. And he's saying for you and I, in our sin, when we neglect and when we forget God, spiritually speaking, we may get kicked out because it shows that we really are not part of God's family. And this metaphorical locust judgment is going to come to you unless we turn to the Lord and look at Jesus, who is the one who eats and devours and absorbs all the devastation of what the locust brings. It's a warning for you and I here today, friends. Simple warning. Do you neglect God? Do you forget him? Do you cultivate that relationship? Does he mean anything to you after you leave these doors in terms of your work and your relationships, your parenting? No one says Christianity is easy. It's actually a really difficult life. But if you're really a believer, God has to mean something for you. You have to think about what that means, the word of God and the gospel and the everyday matters of your life. If you never think about God until the next time maybe you get out of bed on Sunday and come into church service, this is a warning for you. It's saying you better really think because the locust judgment of God may come to you unless you waken up and you turn back to him. And this leads us to our second point, the commandments. And he's addressing three different types of people to say, wake up, watch out, see if you're living a locust-type life, wake up spiritually and turn back to God, and this is what he says. Three different types of people in verses 5, verse 8, and verse 11. And this is what he addresses very quickly as we survey this. In verse 5, read that verse with me. This is the first group that he commands. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. And basically what Joel is doing is saying, you're not trusting in God, you're trusting in other things in the world. And the first group that is trusting in something really good, but it's not God, is actually the people who love their alcohol, drink a lot of wine, and get drunk. Now what Joel is trying to say is this, you need a place for trust in God, but you're placing your hopes and dreams in pleasure, in entertainment. They're placing their trust in ecstasy. It wasn't just wine, because wine is fine. It was getting drunk. It was an escapist approach to say, when I can't deal with this world, I'm going to escape temporarily as sort of this medication and get drunk so I can forget about the spiritual realities around me. They often say that in our day and age, in 21st century American postmodern culture, we live in a world of entertainment so that pleasure and entertainment is the opium of our day. Some of you know this guy by the name of Neil Postman, but in 1985, Neil Postman observed in America and said that Americans are imprisoned by our own need for amusement. And they say Americans no longer talk to each other, we entertain each other. They don't exchange ideas, we exchange images. I mean, he didn't foresee social media, but how accurate was he? They don't argue with propositions, they argue with good looks and celebrities and commercials. And if there's any culture that is so inundated by pleasure and choice and consumerism, materialism, it's you and me. The drunkards, so to speak, of the opium of our day. And Joel is saying, if you trust in pleasure to find more joy and more hope, even if you get drunk and you use it as an escapist mentality, Joel is saying, wake up. Trust in God, the true source of pleasure. Because when you escape through pleasure, it makes you really dull to the spiritual realities around you. And Joel is saying, and that's why it's specific, to those who trust in pleasure, he uses a very specific commandment. Wake up. 
awake. Trust in God. He's the true source of pleasure. As Ajith Fernando has once said, God has made us with the capacity for ecstasy, and he expects us to use it. See, the point I'm trying to make is this. Some people think Christianity is so boring. It's a, a straitjacket. It's restrictive. It's uptight. But actually, Christianity, if you really understand gospel Christianity, it's really a religion of joy and delight and ecstasy. It's just saying that the source of all that is in God and not in the good things of this world. And that's what he's trying to say here. Christianity isn't boring. It's a source of true pleasure. God made us in his image for the capacity for pleasure and delight and joy and happiness. And the fact that we could have full ecstasy, but only and ultimately in God himself. And that's why Joel is saying, wake up and trust in God. Well, this old Anglican pastor, Charles Simeon, has once said it this way. There are but two lessons for Christians to learn. The one is to enjoy God in everything. The other is to enjoy everything in God. Christianity is all about joy and ecstasy. The psalmist says in 100, serve the Lord with gladness. The apostle Paul says, rejoice always, I say rejoice. The psalmist in Psalm 37 says, delight yourself in the Lord. Because the true source of joy and pleasure comes in a relationship with God himself, who is the source of all good. And so for those of us here today who really just are living life well, God bless you. But if you're living life so well that you're neglecting God, Joel is telling you here today, you better wake up. As good as ecstasy and joy in this world is, it's going to make you blind to the spiritual reality that the locusts are just around the corner and about to eat your life up. And this leads us to the second group. He talks to those who get drunk, but in verse 8, he talks to people who want to be loved. Verse 8 says this. It's the second commandment. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. Now, here are the people that he's talking about that aren't just about pleasure, but these are the people who are blind and trust not in God, but they trust in love. And the idea in verse 8 is basically saying you have a girl who's not married yet, and she has her dreams, she's being loved, she loves her fiancé, but right before the wedding day, it's basically like the bride losing her fiancé before they ever get married. And all her hopes and dreams are dashed, and she placed her love and sustenance upon this marriage. And even then, Joel is saying, you can't trust in pleasure. You also can't trust in love. As good as relationships and marriage and love is, it pales in comparison to the love that you have in God. This bride whose fiancé dies before marriage, I mean, you can only imagine the depth of sorrow, the hurt and pain, the hopes and dreams have been dashed to see that you're going to get married and have some kids and have a wonderful career and a, a nice house and with a nice zip code with a picket fence and a golden retriever. And you're saying, as good as those things are, you can't trust in love. It's like a, a bride who lost her fiancé the night before the marriage, the wedding. And you may feel good about being loved, and it feels good to have someone love you, and you want to love somebody else, and as good as that is, essentially it can be the basis of your life. And to this group, it's interesting. He doesn't say wake up. He says the ultimate bridegroom is God. The only one who can sustain your expectations for love is God. And he's saying, you better lament. You better be sorrowful. This is a deep sorrow. A sackcloth is the biggest and deepest repentance and saying, if you're spiritually blind and you neglect God, you better be really sorrowful because the true bridegroom, your true husband, is about to pass you by. To know that in Christ, we are truly seen and loved, but you may miss out on this. God is our true bridegroom. That's what Hosea is talking about. That's what Revelation 21 says that we are his bride. That's what Ephesians 5 alludes to when it says the church is the bride and Jesus is our husband. And as good as love is, humanly speaking, it can't compare to the, the eternal, glorious love that God has for us as our husband and as our bridegroom. And this leads us to our third point. 
or to the third group. In verse 11, he addresses the last group here. He says, I'm going to address those who trust in pleasure. Secondly, I'll address those who trust in love. But in verse 11, he says, Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, whale or vine dressers, for the weed and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. And he's saying, okay, folks, don't trust in pleasure. Don't just trust in love. And you know what else? Don't trust in your work and your careers and your vocation. Now, some of you are very aspirational. Some of you already are very successful. And that's really good. Strive for excellence. Do the best that you can with the God-given gifts of who you are. But your wealth, your job title, your resume, your education are never meant to be the ultimate source of your trust. What he's talking about here, the tillers of the soil, the vine dressers, he's talking about work. Don't trust in your work to give you a sense of identity and purpose in life. Now, it's interesting the way that he has three different commands for the three different types of people. For the people who trust in pleasure, he says, you better wake up. For those who trust in love, he says, you better be really sorrowful because you're going to miss out on your real husband. And then here in verse 11, it's interesting that with work, he's saying, be ashamed of yourself. This shame. Let me ask you a question, friends. On a human level, when you think about your career, And I'm looking at high school students as well. You're thinking about the colleges you get into. You're looking at the working folks in terms of the degrees that you have and where you are on the corporate ladder, where you are in the medical field, all really good things. Do you feel a little bit ashamed because you felt like I should have been here, but I didn't get there? Do you feel a little bit ashamed because someone else in this church, a little bit more successful than you, went to a little bit better school than you? Do you feel so prideful because you went... You wanted to go to this college, but now you're going to this college. And on the flip side, do you feel too prideful and confident because you actually reached your goals? Either way, it's the same thing. If you have low self-esteem for not reaching a certain level in education and work, or if you have too much self-esteem because you actually succeeded or surpassed actually what your aspirations were with work and college and school and academics, the same command is there, be ashamed of yourself. Your identity is not in your school. It's not in your work. The tillers of the soil and no vine dressers. Let me try to bring this out a little bit. Work is interesting that he brings in the notion of shame about your productivity, your utility, your contribution to society. Sometimes it makes, it makes us a little bit weird. We can't figure out why there's this sort of restlessness and this sort of level of pride and shame and this dissonance. But I think the Bible helps you to understand why work and your relationship with work is so weird with respect to pride and shame. David Atkinson once said, shame is that sense of unease with yourself at the heart of your being, your sense of identity. And the reason that there's this unease with who you are, this uncomfortable sense of who you are, a level of pride and shame and going back and forth is because on a human level, the way God designed you in this world to flourish and to live in society is that he has designed you to be able to work. In other words, work is just as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, and friendship. See, sometimes we don't think about that. We think, well, what makes... What's basic necessity of human life? Food and water, maybe friendship. But God designed this in Genesis 1 to 3 to say the reason that you can flourish in life, the way that you're built, a basic human necessity is food, friendship, water, work. So when your relationship with work is all messed up, that's why there's a sense of shame or a sense of restlessness or a sense of pride. Work is something that's built into the fabric of humanity. It is a gift of God. Work is something you use to contribute to the peace and prosperity of the world. It's a way that you can love your neighbor, both Christian and non-Christian, is going to be through your work. We love and serve others through our vocation. Derek Kidner has basically said in his commentary, when you read the creation account, animals team, animals reproduce, but man is given an office. He has a job. Adam in the garden had a job to till the garden. He had a job to subdue the world and to have dominion. Adam had a job to name all the animals because he's the only creation in the garden that represented the image of God. And because he's the image of God, he was built to work. 
And whenever we have our relationship with work that disjointed, where we undervalue work or overvalue work, then that's a point when our relationships and our lives become broken and implode and we become disarray. And there's a little bit of restlessness because sin has messed up our work life. We know something is wrong with us. Work never happens the way that we want. We never find full fulfillment in work. Working with people is hard. Technology is always broken. Work never works the way it's supposed to be. It's always broken. And when we address that truth and reality, there's a deep restlessness that comes with work that takes the form of guilt or trying to outprove others or to find that identity and make ourselves feel better or we're rebellious or we assert our independence or we actually are too people-pleasing and we just work hard so that we can look good in front of other people. What Joel is saying is this. Be ashamed if you find your identity and trust in work more than God. Because what's supposed to describe our work on this side of glory? We think work is somewhere that will give us a sense of full identity. You know, as one pastor once said, look at the number of books that are published about how to change the world. It's because we have an elevated view of our abilities and capacities. But it's trying to tell us this. The way the dominant biblical theme about work is, is not to find self-fulfillment and to change the world. It's actually going to be thorns and thistles. That's what characterizes your work until Jesus Christ comes back. That's why you should expect frustration, expect difficult working environments, expect difficult working relationships, because as good as work is, and God could use that, what characterizes this work on this side of glory is what Genesis said. When Adam sinned, God comes in and says, Adam, with your work, now you're gonna rain, raise up thorns and thistles. So when you have a sober assessment of work, it's not supposed to be our all glory. It's not supposed to be all you know, hunky-dory and be self-satisfying that you could find fulfillment in your identity and that you could change the world and everything's good. No, the Bible says, you know what your work is going to be like? Thorns and thistles. Prickly. It's always going to be frustrating. There's always an element that's going to be difficult. But in the work of Jesus Christ for you, you could sustain through that. You can grow through that. God will use you to give you more ability and grace and love to serve your neighbor, to contribute to society, even though your work is described by thorns and thistles. So if you find your identity in work because you think it's going to discover who you are, no, nah, you're thorns and thistles. Be ashamed of yourself, he says. If you trust in love, you better lament because you're going to miss out on your bridegroom. If you trust in pleasure, you better wake up because he's saying you're spiritually dead and you're blind to the realities around you. And lastly, but quickly, the third point is this. If you trust in pleasure, you trust in love, or you trust in work, God is giving you an out, and he's saying you can turn. Verse 14 says this, Consecrate a fast, call a worship service, gather the elders and all the people of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. You can cry out to God who is the source of ecstasy, cry out to God who is your bridegroom, cry out to God who gives you the ability to balance yourself with work and rest, cry out to him. And that's why in verse 9, the psalmist says, to you, O Lord, I call. In the midst of all of this, if you're spiritually dark, if you're spiritually blind, if you're lethargic, he says, call out to God, because Augustine has once said, if Jesus is not prized above all, Jesus is not prized at all. And in the midst of this, you call out to God. You turn to him to see that all the good things of the society we live in find its purest expression in God himself. We will never know why we live in despair in the locusts of our lives, but we can always know the who of our despair. In other words, we, not, we may not know every reason why we suffer and have dark moments, but we will always know the most important answer of the who of our despair and dark moments, which is God. The answer to the whys of your despair will never give you comfort, friends, but the one answer of the who of your discomfort and despair will always give you sustenance and life. That's why Joel, and we'll look at this next week's, 
He's saying the day of the Lord is coming near. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. He's saying you better watch out. The locusts are coming. Babylon is going to invade Judah. You're going to lose everything as sin has invaded your life. And the day of the Lord of judgment is going to come faster than you realize. You better wake up. You better lament and turn. You better actually be ashamed of yourself. But I'm giving you an out, and I'm giving you the who of your despair so you can turn to God and find everything that your heart craves in a covenantal relationship made possible by his son, Jesus Christ, because the day of the Lord is near. Now, I once saw this picture as I come to a close. I once saw this picture of a newlywed. They got married, and they're on their honeymoon. And on this picture, they're on the beach, and it's a tropical picture, somewhere that was in this really beautiful area where the beach was white, the sun was shining, the water was crystal blue, and they took this picture, and it was funny, the reason it came up on Yahoo News is because when you looked at this picture, in the corner of the background, which no one knew until after they took the picture and looked at it, was a very dark storm that was brewing. And then later on, it was one of the harshest storms in that tropical area. But the couple didn't realize it. They thought they were living in ecstasy and bliss. That storm was coming. You just didn't notice it. It was back in the picture. It was small, almost unnoticeable. Until you wake up and you look at a bigger picture of your life and realize the day of the Lord is coming. And some of you spiritually are like that. You're living life well, and that's really good. But Joel is telling you, God is telling you, I'm trying to tell you that because we live in a world that's broken and sinful, our ultimate and most important relationship is God. So if you neglect and you forget him, you're basically like that couple that seems to be doing well, but the day of the Lord is that storm in the background, and it's coming. You may not see it now. You may not sense it now, but it's definitely coming. And Joel's saying, you better watch out. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is near. But I'm giving you it out. You can turn to me. In my son Jesus Christ, I'm giving you a way to turn to me, to repent, to ask for forgiveness, and to find all the things that you crave in this world that doesn't satisfy, you'll find ultimately in a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for you. So friends, that's my encouragement. Realize there is a day of the Lord that is coming. And I pray for all of us who are so consumed by our own lives that we could wake up, repent, perhaps be ashamed, so that we could turn to the Lord and Jesus Christ and have our lives begin to go here and flourish. Let's turn to the Lord and pray. Bow your heads with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for the truth and honest love and reality that you give us in your Son. Thank you that the Bible is real and true about the realities of our lives and the temptations that we have. But we also thank you that you give us a way out, that we could turn to you in your son, Jesus Christ, and that you'll accept us and you'll forgive us and that you'll love us. Help us to be spiritually vibrant and awake, Lord. Help us to return to you so that it could be restored and find healing and wholeness in this gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. We love you with our hearts and pray this in his name. Amen.